Hi everyone. Uh, this is another mini video, which I did tell you video, and this one is true crime, but it is different. So I came across another book, and it's basically just a kind of uh, the different stories about some of uh, the kidnappings in Ireland. So the one today I'm going to do has a good few bits to it. There's the crime itself. There's obviously the story, you know, of the the person beforehand. There's the kidnapping itself. There's after, there's a whole other after, this thing. Uh, so I just thought it was interesting. I always, always knew a bit about it, but yeah. So this is the abduction of Ben Dunn. So by the time this story takes place in 1981, Dunn stores an Irish family-owned grocery store had a turnover of £15 million. So that's Irish punt, so um, it obviously will be a lot more now. And it was the seventh largest company in Ireland. So it was started by Ben Dunn Sr. But today's story is about Ben Dunn Jr. He was the fifth of six kids and they were from Cork. He married his wife Mary Godwin in 1972. Um, his father disapproved, but I read that his father disapproved of all his children's um, love interests. So... Ben and Mary settled down in a house in Castleknock here in Dublin and they had four kids. So Ben Jr. was really involved in Dunn stores. He done a lot of the um like day-to-day -day running of the store. I did read that his dad um I think didn't really know what he was capable of doing. He says uh, Ben Dunn says in an interview that his father would have thought he was a bit of a spacer this type of thing, but he did seem to, you know, run the business well. So on the 16th of October 1981, Ben Dunn Jr. was driving up to um, the new opening of a, sh of a store in the north of Ireland, or Northern Ireland, whichever you prefer, in Portadown. So there was already shops in like Belfast, Newry, Derry, Armagh, and so this was just another one opening up the north. So at this stage, he is the director of Dunn Stores, and he was heading up in his black Mercedes 500 SEL. Those numbers mean nothing to me. So basically, as he approached Killeen, just south of the border on the N1 road, a green Opal Ascona, like, drove down onto the opposite side and blocked his lane. So he kind of, like, swerved into the hard shoulder and braked. Now, I did read in one source that it was, he came upon, like, an accident, like, a, another car, the, the Opal, was, like, staged as an accident, and that's why he stopped to help. He has now stopped on the hard shoulder. Four armed men jumped out, dragged him out of his car and over to the Opal. Uh, they threw a cloth hood over him, and they had, uh, they all had guns. They said, don't ask any questions, and you won't get shot. A lorry driver who did witness this drove to um, a close, like a customs post close by and told the guardie there what he had saw. So as he sat in the back, one of the, one of the, one of the lads sat beside him with a handgun jammed in his ribs. They drove about 20 minutes to a disused uh, building. They tied his hands behind his back and then they demanded his father's and his wife's contact numbers, like their personal numbers, to get to true. They said to him, what do you think you're worth? And he said, nothing, you'll get nothing from me. Basically left alone then, but suddenly in it, like he says, and I don't know, he says an hour later, I don't know how he'd know, maybe what felt like an hour later, uh, he was being pulled and dragged and all of a sudden he could tell they were running across a field and one of them said, the Brits are close. And then they made him run, they ran for whatever amount of time and then they made him lie in a ditch. They were apparently here then for hours and then they moved um, like to along the hedge and as vehicles passed, they would put a gun to his neck, basically, obviously, to be like, do not mess. They then arrived to another car that was driven to another building. Here he would spend the next six days. He would lie on the floor during the daytime, obviously with the hood still on. And then at nighttime, they would lead him to a bed. He was allowed to raise his hood only to eat. And they said, but if he saw their face, he would be shot. Mary Dunn had been out shopping and as she drove home one of her friends um like pulled her over at the, at the side of the road and said they've taken Ben at the border. So Mary went straight to, to her two eldest children's school and picked them up um, because she didn't want them to hear you know indirectly what was going on and then her other two children who were a toddler and an infant at the time 
were at home. So she had the four children then at home with her. As soon as her mother heard, she left Kilkenny and headed straight to Castleknock. Father Dermid McCarthy, who was a close family friend, also came um, to be with them. And basically, they just had to sit there and wait for contact. There was a huge manhunt on both sides of the border. Special branch detectives had arrived in minutes of the kidnapping. Where he was um, taken from was apparently, quote, a favoured terrorist terrain. There was like tiny bogs, hedges, forests and stuff. So it was quite hard to be seen. It was easy to kind of hide if you needed to. And then it was also hard to search and travel over. I'm just going to read a couple of bits from the book um, Kidnapped, True Stories of 12 Irish Hostages. Again, just to kind of give you an idea of what things were like up in the north at this time. So, South Armagh had been a no-go area for the British Security Forces vehicles for more than a decade. Army outposts and observation towers were manned, but all movement of soldiers and equipment, even their rubbish, had to be done by helicopter. This made the Bestbrook to Cross Maglen helicopter flight path the busiest in the world. That is insane. You're probably aware at this stage, especially because I've done it in some of the other videos, the 80s would have been um, during the Troubles, so obviously there was a lot going on. Acutely aware that the area lacked any real policing, the RUC issued an appeal for farmers in South Armagh to search their outhouses and farm buildings, paying particular attention to outlying buildings. The local people were friendly enough, but weary of strangers. An influx of military or police personnel would antagonise the res residents and cooperation would be quickly withdrawn. And then on the other hand, Chief Superintendent Dick Cottrell of Drogheda was in charge of the hunt from south of the border. So he obviously had, you know, the easier task. The men under his command could travel freely and without too much fear of their lives. Although no terrorist group had yet claimed responsibility for the kidnapping, most thought it bore the hallmark of the provisional IRA. If so, it was felt that the active service unit and their captive would almost certainly be holed up on the northern side of the border. The Gardaí were critical of the lack of properly coordinated roadblocks and searches north of the border, and our Taoiseach Garrett Fitzgerald called on the British ambassador Sir Leonard Figgs to express his concern. One direct result of this meeting was that the Chief Constable of the RUC, Jack Herman, took personal charge of RUC operations in the manhunt. Shortly after Herman's direct intervention, a large number of extra police were brought into the search unit with a corresponding increase in special air service personnel. Oh, two vehicles would later be found burnt out, so the Opal car that he had been in and a blue transit van. So this possibly could have been the second vehicle that he had been put into. And then a motorcycle in inside the van had also been destroyed. The business world was outraged by what had happened. That was both north and south. Like, the, you know, Dunn stores at this stage was still, you know, it was a big company. Ben Dunn was quite a big businessman. The book even says Dunn was an influential man in a company that had brought long term jobs to many of the employment black spots of Northern Ireland. It also says how like the family were quite um, private. They didn't really like the public life or anything like this. And then all of a sudden everything was on them, the news and everything. The book also discusses, and I'm just going to say it because it will come up later. Um, so Ben Dunn Sr. had placed the business into a trust. And this was basically to keep the business like a family one and to ensure that the revenue commissioners didn't claim too large of an inheritance tax bill after he died. He had six children and one of his daughters, Anne, was in residential care. But all of the other children, so Ben Jr., Frank, Margaret, Therese and Elizabeth were all directors. But Ben Jr., as I said earlier, was basically involved in all of the day-to-day -day operations. A special mass had been requested by um, Dunstore's employees. So it does seem that he was liked. You know, he was quite liked by his staff. And his sister, Elizabeth McMahon, attended like on behalf of the family. The auxiliary Bishop James Lennon appealed for his release. Both the Irish and British police forces saw this as a humiliating and provocative attack on authority. The road where Ben Dunn was kidnapped was one of the world's most heavily patrolled because of what was going on in, like, with the troubles and everything. So how could this happen, basically? 
The Minister of Justice at the time, Jim Mitchell, made it very clear that a ransom would not be paid. Ben Sr., who was 74 at this time, was, I mean, was basically like, if we need to pay a ransom, we'll pay a ransom. Like, this is none of your business. Like, if we need, if I need to do it to get my son, that's what I will do. The kidnappers made contact and it was arranged that Father Dermot McCarthy would be like their, their contact, their go-to. So he actually met the masked men secretly in Laud and they demanded 500,000. They did say that this was like they were willing to negotiate on this if it was paid quickly. So the first attempt, Noel Fox, who was a family friend and a trustee of Dunstores, took 300,000 um, up as, as the ransom. But he was stopped in Dundalk. Basically, the Gardaí knew that the money had been withdrawn. And so they like they basically just watched them all to see what would happen. Noel Fox was brought to Dublin and he basically claimed that he was a decoy. The second attempt then was made by Father Dermid, and this was on the third night of the abduction. Uh, he was actually discovered in a shed near the border during a follow-up search after there had been a shootout between uh, the security task force and three gunmen at Roach Castle. This was just south of the border from Fork Hill. And then the book says, quote, Knowing the lengths the Dunn family would go to in their efforts to free Ben, the Gardaí took the unprecedented step of forcing Dunstore's branches throughout the Republic to put the takings in the bank each evening. The third attempt then was stopped as well when the RUC up the north got a tip from the Gardaí and they stopped two cars between Newbury and Bambridge. The Minister for Justice said that there would be changes around this law to make it a crime to pay a ransom, basically. So Ben Dunn would later say that he wasn't scared and I don't think not in like a big brave like big brave man way but he said that he asked them he asked them about three times are you going to shoot me and he said that one of the men said to him don't ask that question again if we were going to shoot you we'd have shot you on the side of the road he apparently felt better you know kind of a bit more relaxed after this like he just knew they just wanted the money and that was it so at one point he actually asked for a beer and like that one fella shouted into the other one big fella wants a beer and that the other one called back and said, sure, he should have one. He's a paying guest. Now, on the sixth day of his abduction, Father Dermid made a plea on the radio, like a public plea. said that the Gardaí believe that there must have been some sort of communication in this plea and that perhaps a code word or something had been used. So this was the fourth attempt. Now, a white escort left Dublin's north side that day, but Tottenham Hotspur were playing Dundalk. Like, all traffic was being checked by Gardaí, but it was obviously so busy and then they didn't stay, didn't find this white escort. After Father Dermot had been caught in the shed, the kidnappers demanded that Ben Dunn give them a new contact and that the ransom would now be 750000 So on the Wednesday, he was told things were heating up and that he would be moved. So Ben Dunn was driven to Cullihanna in South Armagh, St. Michael's Church, and they let him out. They gave him three bullets. So two were for him and they said one was for the priest. I think he just kind of didn't really believe this had happened. So it said that he then ran into the graveyard and he hid in an open grave in, front, in case they decided that they wanted to come back or, you know, they were just messing with him or something and they were going to shoot him. Now, Eamon Malley, who was a political journalist um, for Downtown Radio, he had actually been tipped off. So I don't know if the captors, the abductors had told him. But anyway, he was basically tipped off to all this. So he drove to Cullihanna and he basically just started like shouting Ben Dunn's name everywhere. And eventually um, Ben Dunn came, came out like. So he brought him to the local parochial house of Father O'Neill. So Ben Dunn used his phone basically just to ring kind of, I don't know who he rang. It just as an intermediary, intermediary just to let them know that he was safe and that he was okay. But he told them not to tell his wife. So at 1 a.m., Eamon Malley drove him to Dublin. Now, they went through a Garda checkpoint and he wasn't recognised. So, I mean, I don't know. Would you always, especially back, in, back at then, it's not like everything's on the internet and stuff. So maybe a young guard or whatever, a young person wouldn't really know. They'd know the name maybe, but they wouldn't know who he was kind of thing. When they got past it and they got into Drogheda, he phoned his wife then to let them know. Once he was finally home and safe, it was only then that his eldest two children were told what had happened. The family basically 
insist that no ransom was paid, but it is believed that the 750000 was. So Ben Dunn refused counselling after all this. And he was back at work 24 hours later. Two years later, Ben Dunn Sr. died of a heart attack. At this point, the turnover for the company was £300 million and they had 77 stores. Ben and his brother Frank were appointed joint managing directors. But again, Ben basically ran it and he works, you know, he was known to work long hours. He was a hard, you know, he was a, he was a good businessman. He, he was a tough negotiator. He worked hard and he basically turned it into an £850 million pound store and another 20 more branches. It was said he had a rocky marriage and he was seen out often with another woman who was separated from her husband. And it is said that he did um, he did drugs. He'd done cocaine and stuff. He did like to in- entertain, you know, friends, co- you know, friends, colleagues or business, you know, just business people he'd be dealing with, this type of thing. And that he liked to pick up the bills. So on the 15th of February, 1992, the Saturday, Ben Dunn and 10 friends flew first class to Orlando, all by Ben. This was for a golf trip, and they stayed in the Stufers Resort Hotel. They got 10 single rooms, and then Ben Dunn got a $500 a night suite. So, kind of like straight on it, Ben Dunn asked the concierge if he could get him cocaine and female company. So, 32-year-old Cindy Mitchell was asked to arrive. So they were there, they had fun, whatever. And he was told, she was told, sorry, to come back two nights later and to bring a friend. So she did and she brought Andrea Nathanson. So this is the Monday then. He had a large bag of cocaine. Um, so they were all obviously doing whatever they were doing. He told them about being a leading businessman. He told them about the kidnapping and that it was a horrible experience. The women said that he was quite nervous, that he was like, pacing back and forth, muttering to himself. He then asked um, Andrea to leave and Cindy left shortly after. On the Tuesday then, Cindy came back around. Um, It's said that he had a Russian in his room. I don't really know what was going on there. The book kind of mentions that and then it goes off. So Cindy left soon after she arrived and apparently took an imprint of his credit card. On the Wednesday then, it seems that Ben Dunn decided to move to the Grand Cypress Hotel. And this was the most expensive hotel in the area. And he had suite uh, 1708 and this was $1,200 a night. So that night then he found a different escort agency and basically asked for a woman or whatever. So this guy arrives first to the, you know, to his room to get paid basically so he came to collect $300 and obviously once that was paid then Denise Wojcik arrived after 1am and she was greeted with champagne and cocaine she would say that they'd done 50 lines of cocaine she then ran a bath and he phoned for a second girl and so at this point, they're obviously off their heads, especially him, I'm guessing. But they're, they're probably both at. But they are off their head on Coke and probably champagne and other drinks and everything else. So your man arrives at the door again to get the money for the second girl. And he tried to open the safe, which contained £4,000 punt and $19,000. But he couldn't open it. He was obviously like like drunk and off his face and everything so he was just he couldn't remember the code or he was putting the code in wrong or whatever and he was getting annoyed and you know frustrated and Denise offered to help and stuff and he refused and he got annoyed and the more he was doing it the more it was you know going on and so he actually phoned down to hotel security to ask them to come up to look at it at this point he told Denise to get out of the room and she says that he swung like a piece of wood at her but that she stayed to try calm him down so then the doorbell goes and opens the door and there's a man standing there in a boiler suit. So obviously he's like the maintenance man or something. But in the book, it describes how the lads in the provisional IRA would wear these boiler suits, you know, um, for jobs or whatever they were doing, because you can just throw them away after. So there's no contact. There can be no trace evidence kind of. 
And so when Ben Dunn seen this, obviously in his delusional, hyped up, you know, paranoid state, he panicked thinking it was them coming for him. So he ran to his balcony in his boxers and was like screaming loads, of, you know, all this stuff. Apparently he was like cowering into the corner and stuff. Now bear in mind at this point, it is now 8 a.m. So people, like people are up, people are in the lobby and, you know, out everywhere. They can hear and they can see him. The maintenance man then, obviously seeing all this going on, rang down to the security manager and told them that there was a psychotic Irish man, you know, going on. So it turns out that you two were also staying on that floor that night. So when he heard like psychotic Irish, he thought it was a member of the band. And so he actually got their security to go up with him to, to you know, approach them or whatever. But obviously then once they figured out that it wasn't them, all this going on, um, they phoned the Orange County Sheriff's Department. So officers came from the Sheriff's Department and the lobby was cleared. There will be talk that he tried to like jump, he tried to kill himself, this type of thing. Um, he would later say, and he would always insist that he wasn't trying to do that. Um, I don't know, obviously, whether he was or not. I can understand. I like. I believe that in that drug induced drug induced stage, he could have been fearing for his life. So would he go to the? Would he think climbing down the balcony he could escape? Who he thought was the IRA? I don't know. They managed to grab him, throw him on the bed and um, handcuff him. They also had to tie his ankles. So he calmed down. But then they put him in the ambulance and he freaks out again when the paramedics put surgical gloves on. Because once again, the IRA used to these. So he's obviously just completely off his face at this stage. Because like the IRA or the IRA, the paramedics and everything would be wearing like paramedic uniforms and stuff. But he was obviously just not in the right mind at all. He was taken to Sand Lake Hospital um, after he was treated here and released. He was brought to the county jail. During all this going on, his wife rang um, looking for him. And the assistant manager had to take the call and basically just say that he was unavailable. And then later on, a police officer actually phoned her back to tell him that he had been found with the cocaine and the escort and everything. Um, Denise Wojciech made a deal so that she wouldn't get any charges if she, you know, told them what happened and stuff. So she told them that in the room they would find a black bag with cash and cocaine in it. And they found it. There was 32.5 grams of cocaine and $10,000. So, like, Ben Ben Dunn was in trouble. Like, he was up for, um, he was charged with, like, drug trafficking, uh, tracking, uh, trafficking offences because of the amount he had. At this stage, all the other golfers were actually out playing, like on the golf course, when they were told what had happened. Now, I don't really know why they hadn't waited for him. Why do you, would you not normally wait? I don't know. Um, and Noel Fox, who I mentioned earlier, went straight away and phoned the Irish Embassy in Washington, and he was given the name of some defense attorneys there in Florida. And he went with, wait for it, Butch Slaughter. So, uh, this guy, this attorney, arrived at 6 p.m. and bail was granted. So then Ben Dunn flew home and obviously by this point all the, like, all the newspapers had talked about his story. Everything that was, when he arrived home, there was press everywhere. So his solicitor, Noel Smith, like his solicitor at home in Ireland, advised that he should hold a press conference that evening at his home in Castleknock. And he did. So he publicly admitted what had happened, what he'd done, and he said he was sorry for the heartache he had caused his wife and his family. Later on, he would do an RTE interview where, again, he said he blamed only himself. And he said that, like any manager in Dunn stores, he put his career in jeopardy by taking illegal drugs. So Butch got the charges for the trafficking dropped and the search of the room was deemed illegal. Noel Smith actually flew in and he had, like, references from... Like that, sports personalities, done stores employees, business, different business people and stuff in Ireland, you know, all, you know, giving character references for him. Noel would say that the kidnapping and the refusal to get counselling caused PTSD. And he pledged that Ben Dunn would go into a rehab in London. So he pleaded guilty to possession and he received a $5,000 fine and he was ordered to go to rehab obviously and then he had to remain under the supervision of that doctor in the rehab for a year 
the directors of Dunn's and his, you know, siblings were furious. So Margaret thought that prison actually would have done him good. So she was going mad at like Noel for arranging all this with the rehab and stuff. On the 16th of July, then they were all on a holiday together and Frank basically proposed new rules. It was seconded by Margaret and there was little opposition from Therese and Elizabeth. And so with this, Ben Dunn was removed as managing director. It then says that his sister Elizabeth, who I believe he was quite close with, died suddenly. It's said that Ben Dunn was offered £10 million to leave, like to, to, you know, to buy him out of the company then. And he refused this. Ben Dunn and his solicitor, Noel Smith, then began litigation to break the trust. So he basically said that it was never supposed to be, quote, a bona fide discretionary trust and that certain members used as and when they wished. John Soros actually then commissioned Price Waterhouse to, re- to report on Ben Dunn's finances for when he was running the company. And they found that there were payments to politician Charles Hawhey. So this is kind of where I didn't really say much about the ransom apart from the family saying that they didn't, they insisted it had never been paid. So basically it's kind of put out there that Hawhey arranged for it to be paid I don't think necessarily he paid it himself but that he arranged for it to be paid and uh, that one whatever amount was paid but basically these payments back people were kind of saying well that was Ben Dunn then kind of paying paying it back now Ben Dunn has kind of never denied and he has said he doesn't regret giving Charles Zahid the money they said they were you know they were not close let's say let's say but they were they were friendly acquaintances, I think. And um, he said that he met Hawhey 50 or 60 times in between 1987 and 1991. And he would say that he would never rule out giving Hawhey money again if needed or if asked. So what I read was uh, property developer PJ Gallagher. Um, so there's a news article from him basically saying, quote, I was horrified to hear that Ben Dunn was kidnapped. I had all my Northern Irish block layers laid off the day it happened and told them they would not work again until he was released. I was in a fortunate position at the time. I had just completed a £16 million property deal and was very cash rich. How he was on the phone night and day, he was very concerned about Ben and was determined to get the man released. He and Noel Fox asked me to provide the money for the ransom. I put £1.5 million into a briefcase and gave it to Noel Fox. I don't know what happened from there except the transaction was carried through and all's well that ends well. He then said, Ben Dunn Sr. gave me back the money immediately after the release. I don't know, maybe they just didn't want to, maybe they did do it themselves. You know, maybe he paid and, you know, the Dunn's family then paid him back. But maybe it wouldn't want to be known kind of at the time because, you know, the whole kind of thing with paying ransoms is then they can do it again. They know they got the money or, you know, another, another person could do it again, this type of thing. But like Ben Dunn would say in an interview, uh, Charlie Hawhey and Patrick Gallagher, God rest both of them, had nothing to do with the ransom being paid. I think I would have had an idea if they did. He would say about giving Hawhey money. I gave him money, but I know I'm not corrupt. I'm in the business today and I have a lot of people be doing business with me. If they thought I was corrupt, they wouldn't deal with me. So the trust was started in 1961 and it was deemed that in 1985 they would be allowed to get their shares. Um, But there would have been a huge tax bill. So it basically continued under the four trustees. I'll be honest, I don't know a huge amount about trusts and stuff. I think you can take some money out of your trust here and there. Is that the whole idea? Like they're trying to say that Ben Dunn was spending money that wasn't really his and he's saying that others were doing it. So Ben Dunn lodged his complaint in the High Court on the 22nd of September 1994. He basically called the trust a hollow sham. He said that some of the directors had requested money be lodged in overseas banks using fictitious names. Apparently Dunn stores like dismissed many of the executives who would have been allies with Ben that would have been on his side. His claim was finally settled on the steps of the four courts in November 1994 for 125 million pounds so the original offer had been 10 so he held out the report that margaret had done by um price waterhouse 
did it showed so basically it showed like unusual payments and dodgy payments and stuff and there were payments to a politician but it wasn't to Hawhey it was to Fine Gael Minister Michael Lowry and this included covering the renovation to his home so this story was leaked and then obviously the opposition in the Dáil demanded his resignation so on the 29th of October 1996 Lowry resigned So obviously with this all going on, the revenue commissioners then came after um, Ben Dunn because obviously he essentially received his like share. So it said that he settled a 30 million pound like debt, tax debt or whatever with them, which was a record amount. So I'm going to read from the book because again, now I'm coming to the parts where again, I don't really know. So don't don't come at me if you know all this. What What I'd ask you to do is give me like the like dumbed down version in the comments uh, for me and anybody else who doesn't really get it basically with all this going on the government had to act and it did just that the committee on procedure and privileges appointed a retired judge Jared Buchanan to report on payments by Dunn stores to politicians so before he even delivered his report they set up a tribunal of inquiry under the chairmanship of Justice Brian McCracken so, like, I don't really know why they asked for the first one to be done if they then just went ahead and set up the second one. But anyway, the issues under investigation were much the same as Buchanan had been charged with. But the tribunal would have greater powers in that it could subpoena witnesses. The McCracken Tribunal sat in public for the first time on the 24th of February 1997. The first witness to be called was Ben Dunn on the 21st of April. His evidence contained three points of immense significance. He said that he had donated money to numerous political parties, apparently not asking for or receiving any political favours. He said he had given a total of 1.3 million to Hawhey. Three £70,000 bank transfers had been handed personally to Hawhey at the home of the former Taoiseach in North County Dublin with the words, Look, this is something for yourself. <laughs> so, how he was cut out. So now he couldn't say like that he didn't get this money. So, basically this kind of opened the can of worms that would become, you know, politicians taking money and stuff. It wasn't really it's not that it wasn't a thing here, but it just wasn't really known and it wasn't I suppose we weren't held accountable. And this kind of opened that. So there was the McCracken Tribunal and the Moriarty Tribunal that would come along. In interviews later in life, Ben Dunn would say of, you know, his past. I've had lucky escapes right through my life and I knew that there was going to be somebody up there looking after me. I really believe that. He said there were times when he just didn't want to be Ben Dunn. He said he was a delinquent as a child and as I said earlier, his father regarded him as a spacer. He says that having this unlimited amount of cash is what sent him off the rails. He said that when he took over the um, Dunn stores, he claimed that he was just unprepared for the kind of wealth that he had found. Quote, I didn't have money until later on in life, maybe my 30s. And certainly if you have a lot of money and you haven't been educated enough to how to use it, it will certainly put you off the rails. He also said then that he had actually been attending a psychiatrist for almost 15 years. So in one of the news articles, Ben Dunn is basically compared as in as the Irish version of Donald Trump. Obviously not the political side of it, but you know, the business side. And they say that unlike Trump though, most people who meet the Irish businessman tend to at some level like him or at least enjoy his company. Dunn is a much warmer inv- individual. And this was basically because after he left Dunn's, like after, you know, was basically removed... He then went on to, like, he is a businessman. He went on to continue to be a businessman and tried other things. Some failed, some done really well. So some of the kind of bad things he done, he, it says here that he, like, tried to sell sandwiches to shops for 70 cent each. I don't know about that one. I don't really remember. He, it says here he tried to develop a cemetery on a prime site in London. I don't remember that one either. Now, I do remember this one. He set up a web business. And it was basically like, you know, the buy and sell, this type of thing. And it was kind of coming to the end of when that was used, really. Um, And it was called BenDunDirect.com. So I remember hearing these on, I think that was around 2000, 
2008, 2009, I think, because I remember the job that I used to be working in when I heard it on the radio. And um, he used to say something similar to, you know, try us for 30 days. And if you don't like us, don't use us anymore. <laughs> and I just, I always found it so hilarious because it was, um, I'll see if I can try to find it. You know how people would be like, oh, try us for this long. And if you don't like it, you get your money back. Thing, And it was just like, well, if you don't like us, don't use us anymore. <laughs> it's like, but like, I'm not giving you your money back. <sighs> anyway, um, it says also then he tried to do like discount sales to the art market. Um, but that failed after less than a year. Now, most of you, I'm sure, know at this time, uh, bend on gyms. It says in the mid-90s, like to the end of the mid end of 90s. I don't really remember it being that soon, but I do know by kind of the end of the 2000s, he definitely had a few. So he saw there was a gap in the market for gyms. You know, it, the, it wasn't really as big a thing here, I think. Not that it wasn't a thing, but, you know, he just, there was an opening there. So basically he set them up and like they're really they're run really well to be honest they're um a very successful chain i think he's closing a few i think i saw recently a couple of them are closing now obviously kind of whatever that went on with covid and stuff i used to go to one of them and there was a pool in it but i remember then after covid they like filled in the pool and kind of just created a flat space so that you know the floor so that it was just extra space for like more treadmills and stuff like that because obviously maybe that was what would make more money. Like he's a smart man. He's not an idiot. Like he is the director and the controlling shareholder of all Ben Dunn gyms. Talking about work, he says, I've always considered work a hobby. If it's a hobby, you do it as you want to do it. He talks about being, um, you know, well received, even with everything that went on, uh, being well received by the people of Ireland. And he says they've not only been decent, they've been respectful. They've taken the good and the bad of Ben Dunn. So that is the um, ups and downs of Ben Dunn. So let me know what you think of this case. It's a bit different. Um, would you rather kind of stick to like the murders and stuff, missing people, or do you like kind of uh, a different range, I suppose? Like I know I, I like learning. Obviously the main ones I like are obviously the missing persons, unsolved, this type of thing, but it is good to branch out and stuff. So let me know anyway what you think um i hope you're all well as always if you have any case suggestions let me know Um, i will be returning to the operation trace uh, video soon but the next one won't be one just to kind of um i don't not to take a break but just to just to kind of keep up other other true crime cases as well Um, you know keep them valid i'm so bad with thinking of words sometimes keep them in in the mindset relevant if that's the word so yeah i hope you all have a lovely week stay safe put your rubbish in the bin and yeah see you in the next video thanks <laughs>